Hello and welcome to online worship today with First Presbyterian Church of Bryan. We are certainly happy that you are here with us this, the Sunday of August 30th, 2020. We would like to invite you to more fully participate in worship through accessing our bulletin. So if you are viewing us by smartphone today, you should see the video here with a little chevron in the lower right hand corner just underneath the video. If you click that chevron, you should get a full drop down of our scrollable bulletin. If you are watching us by computer today, your screen should look something like this. Now just underneath your video on the lower left hand side, you should see a button that says show more. If you click that button, you will also get a full drop down of our entire bulletin so that you can sing with us and join in on the liturgy. If you are watching us via smart TV, we'd like to invite you at this time to visit us at fpcbryan.org. Once again, that is fpcbryan.org. That is our website where you can find a full printable version of our bulletin. You can also give electronically, seen here circled in the upper right hand corner of our homepage, and you can check out our mission opportunities and the different programs and ministries that we have going on here at First Presbyterian Church. We are certainly happy that you have come to join us today, and we hope that you enjoy this worship service. Welcome. welcome you to worship today. In Psalm 47 verses 5 through 7, we find these words, God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with a song. Let us praise God together. And would you join us in praising God together by singing hymn 268, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Holy One, 
across months and years, we acknowledge that we have been filled with praise, doubt, conviction, and questioning. We know you are always with us, but we often do not feel your presence, and we close ourselves off from your guiding hand. We know that you are sovereign, just, and gracious, and we have hope for the future you will bring, but we also feel stuck here and now in a place of wandering, many times forgetting that it is the wandering that will lead us back to you. Forgive us and open our hearts, God, to understand your promises and to live with certainty and hope that a tomorrow of your making will come and we will freely know love, compassion, and joy. Help us to live each day counting on your unfailing love and grace. Friends, this is the good news of the gospel, that Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power for us, Christ prays for us. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and made new. Hallelujah. Amen. reading from Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 53. Listen now for the word of the Lord. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of all sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father has promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's window features the victory of the resurrection and the way to ascension for Jesus Christ. He stands poised like a warrior who has completed his mission, but truly, it has only just begun. At his feet, we see an unconscious Roman soldier, darkened by the stains of the past, a symbol of oppression and earthly power. And Christ stands in victory, victory over death, sin, and darkness. God's Son, the Messiah, the champion over all that which would serve to oppress. His victory brings grace and love and forgiveness. And he is bigger than any governing power, than any man and over any spiritual creature. He has fulfilled his mission to liberate and to redeem. In his left hand, he holds the flag of the kingdom of Asturias. This flag is the one that lines the coast of Spain, where we find the Camino de Santiago. You might recall two weeks ago when we were focusing on the baptismal window, we took a look at the scallop in John's left hand. 
That scallop shell is the symbol of the beginning of the pilgrimage of the Camino de Santiago, and here the flag seems to be the symbol of its end. But at the same time, we are reminded that we are still on this pilgrimage. Remember, a pilgrimage is a symbol of life on earth, our spiritual connection journey to find God, to find oneness with God. Now, many scholars call this moment the atonement or the at one meant. It is the moment when we are connected once again with God, our creator, when we have been reconciled and can stand hand in hand with God once again. Now, Jesus holds this flag because his earthly journey has been completed, just as one might complete the Camino. But the flag, as I said, reminds us that we are still on that pilgrimage. And when Jesus charges his disciples to go out and to pray and listen and discern and then witness, he is handing that flag to them to take it up and continue the journey ahead. Now in our passage, Jesus points back to the law of Moses and shows us that the scriptures have been fulfilled. But the disciples need to understand the scriptures. See, even those that have walked with Jesus day by day and learn from him every hour, even they need a little something more to help them comprehend the truth at the heart of scripture. Now this need to understand, that's what brings us into this present moment. He tells them that they must wait and pray and hope because the spirit will fall upon them as his father has promised. And that spirit will make them to truly see the gospel truth. And only then may they go out to all people of all nations of every kind to witness to the truth in the future. Now this is Jesus's charge, not just to the disciples, but to believers like you and like me. And friends, it is not kind, it is not beautiful, it is not gentle. This text should come with a warning label because if we do exactly as Jesus has asked of us, then we will face our worst enemies. We will face ourselves in that time of contemplation and waiting before the truth is revealed. See, to pray to understand requires an openness that most of us have never really, truly known in its raw sense. We must see our true faces in the mirror of our souls, and that should frighten us, <laughs> because what is deep-seated within us can be deeply frightening. The door to our hearts cannot be opened if we do not encounter our own biases, our guilt, our greed, and our sin that lives within us. We have barricaded our hearts with the things that would serve us. We've made other gods out of our preferences for self-preservation. And it should frighten us. It should frighten us just how easily that we would falter in our attentions how easily we would listen to another voice over the voice of God, and how easily that we would call our own voices that of the Spirit. It's idolatry. It's blasphemy. And it is frightening. Now the sad thing is that if that statement doesn't upset us, if this scripture doesn't move us to feel that twinge of being frightened, it means that we are only conditioned to be used to such behavior. I mean, we see it every day on the news and in social media, and we hear it from our friends. We have the audacity to label our own wills in God's name. Friends, God's will is clearly stated in this scripture. Redemption, forgiveness, and reconciliation all given in love. 
Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. We hear in this, in this text, forgiveness. Now in the ancient Greek, the word for forgiveness is aphasin. It literally is a term for liberation from debt, liberation from captivity, or liberation from systemic oppression. In Jesus' time, debt directly led one to a life of enslavement, and it was a very real fear for the majority of the population. Now think today, that population, our population, also lives within the anxiety of being in debt leading to enslavement, except enslavement today is slapped under a new label, a nicer sounding label. Verse 47 calls attention to the issues of both spiritual and this world, and it should change the way in which we receive this scripture. Systemic oppression was very real under the Roman Empire for God's people, and it takes vulnerability in ourselves to see just how ugly and how veiled systemic oppression is within our own time as well. We have not escaped that part of human society. Now, after all, Christianity was not meant to be kept in a box for the day that we venture up to the doors of heaven. Christ is alive. And we are called to live into this charge of witnessing to God's truth, God's liberating truth here and now. Now, like I said, this charge Jesus gives really needs a warning label because we must be open to being entirely made new in Christ. That is, if we truly seek God's truth. For in God's truth, there are no alternative facts. <laughs> now in verse 48, we are directly called to be witnesses that Jesus' sacrifice calls for good news to those in need of forgiveness or that of liberation. Jesus charges us to be changed. Changed in here. Changed in here. That we may go out into the world and upset the things that would serve to oppress, to enslave, or to hold down our brothers and sisters of all nations. Luke's message to us today highlights a Christ who is pointing his faithful to the beginnings of the work to be done on this earth. But before we can get there, there is a process and a sense of order that we must go through before we can dare to open our mouths to speak God's good news and God's truth in that good news. First, they must wait, they must pray, and they must listen so that they may receive the Holy Spirit who will open their minds to properly understand the scriptures. Jesus has fulfilled the prophecies of making a way for forgiveness and redemption, but these things must be known through holy wisdom in order to be shared with all peoples of all nations. To witness to the gospel in the absence of the Spirit is to bear the mouth of a fool. It is as you have heard it. It's best to keep one's mouth closed rather than to open it and remove all doubt. So, do as Jesus has said. Pray, listen, discern. Only then can your mouth bear the power of God's truth. The power structures have been upset. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. And Jesus came that all peoples may be made new again through forgiveness and grace. And the disciples were being called upon to understand that the gospel speaks not only for the thereafter, but for the very real here and now. The charge Jesus gives, therefore, holds weight that requires all of us to work together in love and with grace, to be transformed by the Holy Spirit so that we can recognize and work to overcome that which would serve to harm. After all, do we really wish to be the source 
of another's pain? Do we really wish to go out and harm another as God's children? Do the things that we have adopted in our lives cause harm to others, intentionally or unintentionally, spiritually or in society? Our hearts must be open for God and only for God above all else, that we might correctly comprehend the word of God and God's will. So let me dare to ask, is the Bible a sword or is the Bible a flashlight in the dark? Is the Bible a sword or is the Bible a flashlight in the dark? How do you use the word of God? That's what I'm asking. Or furthermore, do you let the word of God use you? Jesus has had victory. He stands not as a member of the Roman Empire or as a member of a political party, but he stands on his own, victorious, and calling us to be moved and molded and born anew in the gospel news. In our window, Jesus stands above the symbol of systemic oppression and government influence seen in the soldier. And Jesus also stands with his foot atop the symbol of death. Look at him. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. And God is alive and God is greater than all things. This is good news. God is love. And love is alive. That is what reigns. So if we pray and if we listen and we we discern well, we may find times when maybe instead of praise and love, we feel angry. And that is okay because that is part of this journey. And I don't care what anyone else is saying out there, but God is so big and so mighty and so awesome doesn't matter how big your anger is, God can take it. No man, no politician, nothing earthly could stand up against God and cause harm or ruin or beat back God. So listen up. Christ is our King. God is love and the Holy Spirit will guide us in the righteous path, but only only if we dare to shed the skins of our egos. To come before God and to fall upon your knees, to open yourself to seeing the ugly places within you and also the beautiful ones that will grow. That is what Jesus is asking of us right now. And friends, that is true liberation. And once we understand, we will be compelled to go out to all peoples of all nations, all colors, shapes, and sizes. They are all God's children, just as in the window. All these butterflies are different colors and sizes, but they are all still beautifully made for that journey, as are we. We are called to rise with Christ above the limitations and ways this world would make to keep us down. We, we were made to rise up so that we could be transformed like butterflies and to spread the truth, God's truth, of radical transcending love above all else. So. When we read the Bible, how do we know that it is the Holy Spirit who is with us? We should always be asking ourselves that question. 
How do we recognize God's will versus our own will? Well, we must examine whether we are letting God's story and words for us transform us, or if we are interposing our own story onto God's words to transform their meaning. Remember, is the Bible a sword or a flashlight in the dark? Do you use the word or does the word use you? How do we witness to God's love and care for all peoples? How do we uphold grace and forgiveness given to us by Christ? And how do we allow ourselves to enter metamorphosis, that we can become something new in Jesus Christ? And what does it mean to be of Christ in 2020? It is these questions in which we find ourselves today. It is in these questions that Luke's Jesus challenges us. But we know how to begin. Wait. Pray. Listen. And discern. When the Spirit is living wild and free within you, you'll know what to do. And you'll know how to honor the amazing gifts of grace and forgiveness, that aphasian liberation, that Jesus died that we might have it. We are called to open contemplation, that when we do speak, it will be made powerful by God within. God's truth, even when only whispered, will speak louder than all the cries of a thousand men. So let us be a people of prayer and discernment, a people of our King in Christ, a people ready to transform in the Spirit, to know the true love and to phase in liberation of God. And friends, may we witness and move in this world as liberators through the truth of Christ's transcending and radical love for all. We are the church, and with open hearts, with open hearts, we will be the true church. All of us vulnerable believers in victorious Christ, King above all kings, Lord above all and beyond all. So let us praise him that we are saved, that we are loved, that we are forgiven and furthermore compelled to witness in his truth to his unfaltering grace. Thanks be to our Lord in heaven. Amen. Our prayers today are adapted from that predecessor of the Protestant Reformation, John Wycliffe, from the 1400s. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts to receive you and be changed by you. Give us grace to hold righteousness in all things, that we may lead a pure and blessed life and wisely avoid the darkness. Help us to understand and know the treacherous deceit of evil, so that we may not be fooled by its lies and tempting messages. Mold us to be mild, peaceable, considerate, and self-controlled so that we may act sincerely for the good of others and make us steadfast and unshakable in faith, hope, and love. And Lord, let us be quiet in words so that we may not speak like fools, but as is insightful and appropriate. Turn us toward you that we may be completely yours. Heal us, that we may be completely whole in your grace and only with your help. Watch over the sick and those in peril, those who are ill, 
struggling mentally and physically. Those who find themselves in situations of joblessness, hopelessness. Those who are downtrodden and anxious. In these times, know our pain and give us strength and peace of heart to overcome, to bear with others, and to be persistent in faith. We know you are always with us, so open us to know your presence and your grace. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray to you together, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you join us in singing, Christ is Alive, hymn number 246, singing stanzas 1, 4, and 5. go in the peace and the power of Jesus Christ, a peace and power far surpassing all human understanding, and go forth to love and serve the Lord, transformed for serving in the life of Jesus Christ, crucified and resurrected, always to God's glory, God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we all say together, Amen. Amen.